and welcome. It is May 4th. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And this morning we are taking up uh, Act 66 passed in 2019 related to uh, testing for lead in water in schools and child care facilities. Um, and we are looking to, we will start with David Englander from the uh, Department of Health to just give us an update on, on where you are and, and the, the possible need for an extension. So Good morning, Madam Chair and the committee. I'm delighted to be uh, before you um, in this, uh, this interesting time. Uh, my name is David Englander. I'm the Senior Policy and Legal Advisor to the Commissioner of Health. Um, Madam Chair, my intention was to give you sort of a brief overview of sort of where we were and where we are and where sort of we, we think things are going. Thank um, you. So overall, I want to say, and I, and I we provided a, uh, as the committee knows, a, um, an update um, in a report in January. Uh, things were were running smoothly then. They were running smoothly until March fifteenth, when I can't recall what, but something interrupted um, the project. Um, as of today, uh, I'm just going to look briefly at my notes. Um, Four hundred fifty one schools were required to test under Act sixty six. Two hundred eleven schools. Uh, have tested that represents 48% of schools, um, and that that excludes the, um, the 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 number of schools that were uh, exempted because they had done. There were 46 schools that were exempted because they had done testing uh, within the time frame uh, time frame as exempted under the Act. Um, there are uh, 235 schools either haven't been tested or haven't received their results yet. Um, we did. Uh, actually have every school in the state scheduled for testing except for six. So we've had a little trouble with uh, some communications with a handful of schools. Um, by the end of the school year, we were to have completed uh, taking all of the samples by the end of the school year with the hopes that we would actually, we would have completed all the actual testing by the end of the summer and therefore have been well ahead of the, um, of the, the 2031, I'm sorry, 12, 31, 20 deadline. Um, so uh, that's a sort of broad overview. We've got about half the schools done. We had ramped up and we're ready to go to the second half uh, of the schools. Um, and then, uh, then the school, schools were shut. Um, uh, I'll just do it as a brief reminder that when schools are closed, we can't do the testing because they need to be in normal operation so that we get an accurate view, an accurate snapshot of what's actually in the water at the time when they're being used by students, staff, um, and teachers. So we find ourselves in a, uh, in, a, in a state of great uncertainty as we don't know when schools will reopen. Um, we think it probably makes sense for there to be an extension of the deadline. Um, Mr. Gray and I spoke, uh, I communicated to him that perhaps it makes sense that it be, that the deadline be pushed off to um, you know, the end of next year of 1231, um, uh, uh, 21, as we don't know what when schools reopen and whether or not there will be interruptions, uh, you know, throughout the next school year. Um, uh, we, the Department of Health would support that. We'd also be supportive of language if the committee were, uh, requested um, or required the department to, uh, to finish the testing as soon as practicable. Um, that, um, that intention was clear based on, on that we were well ahead of schedule um, during the original uh, uh, testing period. Um, a brief fiscal note. Um, the Department of Health has spent $767,000 uh, thus far, that um, which includes about $30,000 uh, of remediation. Um, based on the current failure rates, um, the, the original budget uh, would actually cover the entire project. And I'd be delighted to, uh, to take your questions. Thank you. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure, quite sure if I got that. So are you saying that you have enough money to see it through? Based on, yeah. based on the, the burn rate during the project and on, and on the failure rate, and by failure rate, I mean the failure rate of, I should have been more clear, the failure rate of, of, um, uh, of, of faucets and sinks, et cetera. Um, not the failure of, of, of any parties. Um, so as of today, yes. So we calculate based on current failure rate um, that we would have enough money to finish the project based on the based on the estimated budget. Thank you, Kathleen James. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, we spent so much time um, talking about, um, you know, projected failures and how much things might cost and what would need to be replaced. Can you elaborate a little bit, David? I am so curious to know, um, you know, uh, what you've spent money on and, and um, you know, what, what were the most common, uh, you know, projects that had, you know, things that needed to be replaced and what, what are you guys finding and what are you spending money on? Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful question. Uh, so to be frank, most of that money was, was staff time was Vermont Department of Health staff time. So that includes, you know, legal logistics, epidemiology, um, getting the, the, rap, the lab up and running, buying the, the, all the, the sampling materials, sampling, uh, well, materials, and sent out to schools as well as the shipping and, 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 uh, and the, all the things associated with the logistics of getting, getting the bottles, et cetera, out to, to schools and, and child cares and then getting them back. Um, the failure rates are, are pretty much in line where, we're, where we thought they would be, which was, which was nice. It was based on, based on the pilot, they're within, within range. Um, there's only been a major problem with two schools where it appeared to be that there were issues related to the water chemistry and the pipes and not to the actual fixtures themselves. Um, schools thus far um, have been uh, uh, incredibly responsive. They've been creative about how to think about um, uh, replacing taps, so going from several taps to going to a, a, bottle, a bottle filler station. Um, have I answered your question? Um, yeah, I, I was just curious. It just seems yeah. like we spent so much time talking about what schools were going to do, and so I'm just dying to find out what schools have been doing. Yeah, and and I think that, that we're we're kind of we are still at the beginning of the of the we're at the front end of schools getting there getting their results back and, and taking remediative, remediative actions. So we really won't know more until the fall um, in terms of what they're actually going to be doing. As I said, it's only, it's only $30,000 in remediation uh, funds spent so far. So we have a snapshot. We'll learn, learn a lot, lot more in the coming months. Great, thank you. So you indicated you had two schools that actually had problems that were beyond the remediation that we'd been yes. looking at. Um, how did, and we did not provide money for that uh, resource. Right. As I remember, can you tell me um, with, with this municipality? How did they respond? So um, they that this we that, so DEC worked with the schools mm -hmm. to, to to determine what um, what uh, plumbing had to be replaced, if any. There was a, there was one. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It was one childcare in one school, and the the, the in the case of the school, it was really uh, the particular water chemistry of the um, that that was coming out of the municipal water system. And how it was interacting with with the piping in the schools, and DEC even working with that school to correct that. And in the case of the the childcare, I know it's not the bailiwick of this committee, but um, but pipes needed to be replaced, um, and the landlord did that, uh, I believe, in the fall. Thank you. Any other questions for the Department of Health? Okay, let's go to Emily Simmons from the Agency of Education. Hi, I don't really have anything other um, to add. We agree with the Department of Health, obviously, that uh, extending the timeline about one year makes sense. I think that David's suggestion of moving the deadline to December 31st of 2021 makes the most sense because it's during the same school calendar time and the cycles of the school year are the same as was originally planned. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, Chloe, it's possible that we've, we've gotten our answer, but do you have anything else to add in terms of uh, fiscal issues? Um, I, I think it was covered. Um, oh, just I, for the record, Chloe Wexler, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, the only thing that I would add and potentially um, David could comment on is in the appropriation that we initially provided, there was funding for two limited service positions. Um, and just sort of flagging that as um, something for potential consideration if those um, if, you know, funds will have to be reallocated or if included in David's estimate was um, some additional funding if those positions need to continue. Um, it's also noted that they, they are, um, pretty close to completion of all of the testing. So that was the only other thing I flagged. 
Um, but it was one time, it was funded with one time money. Um, so that money is still available until the completion of the project, regardless of when the deadline is. <clears throat> I can imagine the Department of Health might be looking at that money. <laughs> so right, so um, we would be, we would, for whatever period of extension, um, the, the, this limited service position in the Department of Health and at DEC, we would need to extend those times. Um, our per, the person who was working on this has now been moved into COVID response and is, and is receiving money from a separate, a separate funding stream. Um, my understanding from our business office is that can be handled through the, through the budgeting process and that there wouldn't need to be anything in this bill if that made things simpler. Okay, does that make sense to you, Chloe? Um, yes, hold on, I think I'm muted. No, you're not, you're good. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, that makes sense to me. Okay, um, Sarita Austin, do you have a question? You're muted, Sarita. I'm all set. Okay. Okay, so Michael O'Grady, you have been in conversation with these folks and looked at some language. Sure, so uh, I don't think I'm a co-host, so I don't think I can share anything with you if but the language that's been proposed. I mean, Avery, a, do, you, do you have that language that you can share? Or? It's on your committee's website. Yes, um, I'll, pull it, I'll pull it up right now. Okay. Thank you. So just generally, it's a very simple change. Uh, the act last year required uh, the testing to be done on or before December 31st, 2020, that each school district, supervisory union, uh, independent school or child care provider shall collect a first draw sample and a second flush sample from each outlet in each building or facility it owns or controls or operates. The only change here would be changing that 2020 uh, year to 2021. And that is the only change. That's, that's pretty simple. <laughs> We don't usually get them that simple. Um, I'm going to look to see any comments or questions. I just lost my participants list. Any questions on this? We don't usually get things this clear. <laughs> um, I unfortunately I, I've moved the um, uh, the Act 173 delay already. That's on its way, I believe, up to appropriations. So I. We could tack this onto that, or we could find another place, or just simply pass it as its own bill. Um, but are there any other questions or concerns about this? Anybody need to hear about anything else, or are we comfortable so far? Um, Kate, may I may I um, yes. offer just two yes. things? Please. Um, I'm just curious. There were some other deadlines that were specified in um, Act 66 in regards to um, the when the testing had to become public record and displayed. Um, I believe that was um, March 1st, um, 2021. And also there was an adoption of rulemaking for continued testing. Um, so I just don't know if the committee wants to maintain those dates or if um, the Department of Health has any comments on whether they would like to see those extended as well. Yes. So the department has indicated that the rulemaking deadline does not need to change. Um, and I believe that with the um, posting, it was kind of, uh, I'll look at that again, but I don't think it necessarily needs to change. David, um, I need to unmute myself when I speak. Um, Yes, the department's position is that neither of them have to change. So we can meet both sides. Chloe? Uh, no, I, that was the, um, I just had wanted to flag those two other dates in there, but I'm, I'm nice. happy to hear that they don't need to get changed. Peter Conlon, did you have a question? No. Madam Chair? Yes, please, Dylan. Uh, I'm just wondering, this is purely uh, on the 
staff side here, uh, I understand there's a hiring freeze for certain employees. I know that's probably not uh, consistently applied depending on position and that there's probably a process to get special uh, permission to hire someone. But in terms of extending a limited service position, is that an issue at all? It is not because that person has already, that, that person has filled that position. Michael O'Grady, no? No, I don't have a. Okay, is there anybody, um, comments from the committee? Are we comfortable with this? Why don't we just do your little blue hands to see who's comfortable with this so far? Okay. Oops. All right. Now, do we have everybody here? So, Kathleen, I, I'm not showing that you're. Yeah, I'm trying to raise my hand here. Yeah. Okay. I've lost Kathleen. Kathleen, do you have a problem with this? Kathleen, I'm just checking to see if if you are you're okay with this as written. Okay, good. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, everybody, put put the little blue hands down. <laughs> Is there anybody that has a problem with this? Okay. Um, Emily Simmons, my question to you, are there other delays that you're seeing that we could address here? Are there other delays that the agency will be looking at that we might want to put together with this? And in the Wait process of canvassing our, our division director. So I'm checking on that for you. I found one potential so far. So I think if there is another issue that needs a delay, it will relate to some career technical education pilot programs that are currently in process and any delay there is going or that we would request would relate to some reporting dates back to the General Assembly, but I'm still consulting on that, whether the parties think that a delay is the best approach. So I just have one potentially in the pipeline for you other than this in Act 173. So one. Um... Okay, well let's let's um let's take a formal vote on this. I would entertain a motion. Uh, Kate, could I mention the first? I I do think that um, as I said last time we met, if Emily thinks any other delays might be forthcoming, it might be nice to keep this open as a. So we don't have to do a couple other subsequent tiny delay bills. Right. I just kind of feel like I'm, I'm totally on board with this, but yeah. if it's not so urgent. Maybe we just keep it open for a week, let Emily come back and incorporate any other um, strictly just kind of report it, you know, delay delays of this nature uh, into one bill. I don't know if anybody has a problem with that, but it would feel like a reasonable approach to me. Yeah. Makes sense. It does open it up for amendments <laughs> if we're de delaying everything related to education and that COVID-19 was the only reason I would think that there would be some value in separating them, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to wait. Why don't we, why don't we hold it for now? Um, Emily, if you could get back to, back to us. Um, and um, hopefully much sooner than one week, but thanks for the time. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. And thank you, Michael O'Grady. And thank you, David Englander and, and Emily and Chloe on that. Um, and with that, I will close this portion of the, of the meeting. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the next thing I, I did want to talk about, um, there's a, a lot of discussion going on right now related to the 19 districts that um, are uh, the 19 districts that do not have a budget. Um, as we know, the Senate uh, put forth a bill 
um, in 1.1 that we've seen uh, related to using uh, setting default budgets at last year's um, budget. We worked with the committee uh, ways and the House Ways and Means on another option. And um, so, so that's out there and it, it appears to, to not be, be um, providing much interest. So I've been in conversation with Jim and a few others on another proposal. And um, since I'm now getting requests from people, could you send us your, your draft? Could you send us your draft? I thought maybe we should put this one out as well and just give, give people an opportunity to see another option. I'm not necessarily promoting this as an option that we're, we're you know, ready to move on, but I think it's an option that we might wanna at least have the committee have a chance to take a look at and then put it out for feedback. Um, so rather than just sort of keep it in my pocket, I thought it would be of value to, to, to present that as, a, as another option um, where the committee has an opportunity to, to hear this. So um, Jim Demaray, and, and uh, I suppose we're supposed to refresh, I think, um, uh, the agenda. No, that's okay. So, so Jim, you have um, written a draft that is 7.1 and you've also uh, done a side-by-side -side comparing it to the current Senate bill. So if you could, could um, present this to us, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. What's your preference? Uh, going through the side-by-side -side or the bill itself? I, I think, um, I think go through the bill and then let's pull up the side by side so people can really see exactly what the differences are. Okay. Avery, do you have that? And Sarita Austin, do you have a question? Just wondering, so this wasn't on our agenda? Right. So we can still have this conversation? It's on our agenda now. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's just read the purpose. It's a short bill, uh, three pages. So um, it says, uh, this bill proposes, due to the COVID-19 state of emergency, to establish ed education spending for fiscal year 21 for school districts that do not have uh, voter approved budgets on or before June 30, 2020. A school district's education spending would be the same amount as the education spending in the school district's most recently warned budget. However, a school district may obtain voter approval of its own budget after June 30, as under current law, in which case the, the amount of education spending in the voter approved budget should be in lieu of the education sp spending under this act. So if you scroll down further, uh, section one, and but further, Great. Uh, okay, that reads, um, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, if the fiscal year 21 budget of a school district that has not been approved by voters on or before June 30, 2020, the Agency of Education shall authorize an amount of education spending for that school district equal to the amount of education spending under the school district district's proposed fiscal year 21 budget that was most recently warned, provided, however, that, that the school board, that if the school board warned a fiscal 21 budget that was defeated, the school board shall, on or before June 30, 2020, warrant another budget that is less than the amount of the budget that was defeated. School districts may, after June 30, vote to approve a budget or vote to reconsider or rescind an approved budget in accordance with law and if the school district, district approves a final budget, the amount of education spending in that budget should be in lieu of the education spending authorized by the Agency of Education. And then um, B just says that the amount authorized by the agency will be the education spending as defined in the statute. That's important because that sets the tax rate for the um, school districts and sets uh, the, uh, the amount of um, funding from, from the education fund. So that's tying into a legal definition. And this is unless or until the school district passes a final budget. And then lastly, uh, the school board of the school district shall determine how funds shall be expended under the section. In addition, the school board shall have the authority to expend any other funds received from other sources, including endowments, et cetera. 
Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, scroll on further, April, if you would. Yep, and effective on passage. That's a little bit confusing. It's a little bit easier to see it. When <laughs> I'm sure everybody's going, what are you doing? What is this about? I think it'll help if we look at the side by side so we can see how this compares. Sarita Austin, did you have a question? So what, what your bill is, I'm oh, sorry, should I keep going? Yeah, Sarita, I wasn't sure if you had a question or not. I've got three raised hands, but I can't see them at the moment. Okay, Sarita, did you have a question? No, sorry, I okay. just couldn't get my hand down, sorry. Um, Chris Meadows, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, Jim, basically what this bill is saying is that we're just gonna accept whatever the school board put out there for a warm vote? What, what this bill is saying, it, there are 19 districts that haven't approved our this yet. Um, some of them have um, sought approval and haven't defeated. Some of them haven't uh, sought approval yet. So, so if, if you, if you um, have warned the budget, um, this is saying that um, the amount of your education funding spending will be equal to what you warned. Okay. Uh, and let me just pause because education spending, and this is new, new, uh, new information for me too. Education spending is a subset of a school district's budget. So um, education spending as defined in statute um, covers various categories, but excludes like special education payments for reimbursements, um, parental fundraising, uh, category grants like small school grants. So uh, the budget for school is the whole thing, everything. So it accounts for special ed, ed spending and everything they anticipate spending and receiving. The education spending is a portion of that, okay? So what this bill is saying is, is that wherever education spending uh, amount was in your warm budget uh, for fiscal, fiscal uh, uh, 21, that will be your, your budget for fiscal 21. But uh, the voters still have the opportunity to override that. So you're not taking away any rights. So the voters can then come after that uh, June 30 date and vote a different budget uh, with a different amount of education spending and that would control. So you're not taking anything away. What you're giving is a backstop and the backstop in your bill is the amount of the warm budget. If the school district ha had a budget defeated, then they have to re a budget for an amount less than the amount that was defeated. Okay, so, uh, w but whatever the warm budget is, uh, would be the amount of education spending unless the voters override that by a vote. I think it's gonna be easier to have this conversation if we see the side by side, because I think that we're gonna get into some weeds. I think the side by side shows exactly what the differences are. So I, I'm gonna hold questions for a minute and go to the side by side. And then th from there, I think that um, many of your questions will be answered. Okay, so side by side, the house language is on the left and the Senate language is on the right. Um, the only major difference between these two bills um, is your bill uh, provides funding at the level of the warm budgets and the Senate's bill uh, provides funding uh, at the level of last year's budget. So with no, no inf inflation on that. So uh, that's the difference. Uh, so some of the language is different. I've updated language here and there. So it looks more different than it is, but the only difference between the two bills is your backstop is a different different one. Um, both bills allow voters to vote um, and that would override uh, what these uh, bills would, would um, provide. So both bills don't take away any rights from voters, uh, but they do use a different backstop um, again, house education uh, at the level of warm budgets for fiscal 21, the Senate version uh, would use level funding from uh, fiscal, year uh, fiscal year 20 budgets. Does that make so, more sense? You hear the language uh, on the left side and highlight so it says the school district's education spending would be the same amount as the education spending in the school district's most recently warm budget. The set version is default budgets will be level funded from fiscal year 20, 20, 
20 school budgets, okay? If you go out further, just to see any further differences. Um, Jim, real quick, sorry. Basically, um, the Senate bill allows for the last voter approved spending amount or they can get one passed before June 30th. And ours is just taking the board's warned budget, education spending amount and using that, or they can rescind it after the 30th of June by the board or does the school district voters do something? What happens there? Yeah, so, so the, the way that works is under law currently, um, the requirement is that you can borrow up to 87%. If you have a budget in place by June 30, you can borrow up to 87% of your last year's budget. Um, but uh, if you don't have a, but a, a approved budget, uh, you have to keep warning budgets and keep having them voted on until you get an approved budget by voters. Um, so that's what current law says. Uh, the, neither of these approaches here change current law. You can still borrow 80, up to 87%. You can still um, have a voter approved budget. Um, uh, all this does, it says, if you don't have a voter approved budget by June 30, uh, your backstop will be in your version, um, your, your, the amount of your last warm budget, the education spending amount in your last warm bu budget. On the Senate side, it's your last year's um, uh, uh, education spending amount. So you're using different different um, uh, defaults, if you will, uh, but the mechanisms otherwise are identical. Peter Conlon. Uh, thanks. Question on the same sort of uh, thought process. Uh, so if a school board says, under our version, you know, we don't think we can get this budget passed we're going to use the backstop and take our warned 2021 education spending. Yep. Do the voters still have the right to petition to vote on it? In other words, the school board is the one who calls for a vote. And if, if they sort of have said, we're done voting, we're gonna just adopt FY21 education spending. At that point, do the voters have any power left or is it, is it done? That's a really good question. Um, this does not address that point. Usually what happens is um, if you have an improved budget, then um, it can be rescinded or reconsidered by petition. Right. Or, or by, by the motion of the board on its own. But within 30 days of approval of a budget, um, if there's a petition that's submitted to reconsider or rescind it, then that will happen. Uh, there'll be a further further vote. Um, this language says that if you scroll down a bit, Avery, um, um, a little bit further, a little bit further, if you would. Um, yeah, it's a, a, a little higher. <laughs> Sorry, right here. So it says uh, after the highlight language, um, it says school districts may after June 30 vote to approve a budget or vote to re re reconsider or rescind the approved budget in accordance with law. Um, I think actually given your comment, probably that needs to be clarified to, to say that they can petition to have the approved budget um, done by the board or, or to this mechanism uh, reconsider because that usually there, there's a vote on the, uh, by voters on, on the budget this, that is approved and then it's reconsidered. Now we're having another mechanism. So that's worth cl cl clarifying, I think, if you take this forward. Of course, we have the um, continued uncertainty of how somebody actually petitions, given social distancing and all of that, collecting signatures. Correct, yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, that, that's, that, that can be worked around. All right, yeah, I do think that probably we need some clarification there yeah. as to yeah. what, what the voters' continued abilities are. And that would be the same with the Senate bill as well. I mean, what were the options options be if their default budget is 2020? What would they be? What What's the role there? Same thing, exactly the same. The same language too. If you look up on, on the right hand side, 
it says same language school districts may after June 30. So th those mechanisms are identical. You'll see that I use the, the, the Senate bill uses the word budget. You use the word um, uh, education spending, um, and that's just um, an, an inadvertent difference. Uh, the Senate bill was drafted at a time when I didn't appreciate the difference between education spending and budget. So I've got, if the Senate bill goes forward, I have to clean this up a little bit to make it look more like yours and refer to education spending. Um, but the only little differences here again is that the, um, the uh, backstop is different. Everything else is the same in these two bills. And the only difference in backstop is what you're looking to. A, one budgets for you for fiscal 21 <coughs> and level funded budgets, fiscal 20 for them. I'm going to get to questions in a set, second. We're going to have uh, Caleb and then Kathleen and then Sarita. Um, but just, just to clarify by Jim here. So with the two bills, what they say is if you don't, if you can't get to a vote and you don't have a budget by June 30th, here's what you can do. This is your backstop. One is you're going to use last year's budget and it, whatever it is, ed spending, because really what we're talking about is the ed fund and ed spending is the ed fund. Yeah. All the other stuff, Title One, that's other money. We're, we're, we don't have an opinion about that. We don't, we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about the Ed Fund. So with, with the Senate bill, your, your default is uh, last year's budget, you can continue to vote until you can get one that's passed by the voters. In the Senate, in the House, the House bill, I, I'll just call it my bill because it's not a committee bill at this point. It's just an option that I'm putting on the table for people to consider. Um, would be this, the same thing, only instead of it being last year's budget, it's the currently warned budgets, and all of the all of the failed districts with failed budgets have newly. Uh, they all have revised budgets, and they're all lower. I don't know if there's a way to get to that. And all of the districts that um, had not voted have budgets except for, for Rochester Stockbridge. Um, so just, just clarifying what that difference is. Um, my understanding, that's, is that accurate? That's, that's correct, yep. Okay, so uh, um, Caleb. Thanks, Jim uh, and Skate. Um, so, I, I do, uh, I think some of the questions that Peter and Chris already asked spoke to some things I was wondering about. Um, I am, my understanding of the 87% rule is that that comes into place when you do not have a budget. You can borrow that amount, but you do not have a budget. And anybody who you're contracting with as a teacher knows you don't have a budget. And then you have a provision to supersede, well, no, to have a budget, which is they don't allow you to borrow for the full 100% in anticipation of revenues. That's if I have some part of that, do I basically have that right of how in the normal circumstances, how that 87% rule works? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the difference here that seems really different to me is we are not saying you can borrow 100% of your old budget, but you still have to pass a budget. We're saying the AOE is going to give you a budget without any voter approval. And here's the size and shape that's going to be. So that is a horse of a very different color. And I'm not saying it's not the appropriate solution but you, I think, cannot therefore sort of pretend that that 100% or if it's the budget they warned, whether it's a House or Senate version, you can't pretend that's the same as an authorization to borrow 87% when in fact, it is a budget. It is a full-on budget as I understand it. it so is I at one point, this, this is the confusion I had with language, which is this is not a budget, this is education spending, which is a part of the budget. Right? Okay, excuse me, yeah, so I, I guess it's, and yet, education spending is only ever authorized by voting on a budget. So it's, yeah. it's you know, it, from voter standpoint, they don't say, hey, we're going out to vote on education spending this week. They say, we're going out to vote on our school budget this week. Yeah. So you, you get into some nomenclature issues. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, the, that that is correct in the bill. But in the conversation, I think we can kind of colloquial, colloquially call it a budget. Um, I just have a concern that it is not a similar situation where a, a school district or a board would warn a vote to come back over that 87% because everybody knows that borrowing 87% when you're trying to run a whole school year is not going to cut it. Whereas some of the amounts we're talking about could very well cut it. 
And so there wouldn't be that incentive that there normally would be. So I just would say it's not really the same context as the current law exists within. So that, that's just kind of a statement I want to say that when we say this is current law, yeah, I get it, but the context is pretty radically different. Um, and I, I, I have a separate point that I just want, there's a question I want to ask. If you could just talk a little bit about, I cannot imagine a situation in which a budget is approved and then rescinded after June 30th. That sounds illegal to me. So can you just explain the part of the current law whereby, let's just say our district, which passed a budget, we're under contract, we've got letters of intent out to all our teachers. How could our community ever vote to rescind that budget that I feel we're now contractually obligated to? That's a part of the current law that I feel um, really confused by. Yeah, so current law um, does allow approved budgets to be um, reconsidered um, and or rescinded. Um, so obviously that's a different thing. So rescinded means as if the vote never happened, right? We started fresh. We consider it is that the, the budget that was approved is in place, but it's gonna be uh, a different version will be considered again. So there's a mechanism in, mechanism in current law that exists and they can be triggered either by a petition by the voters or by the board. And I imagine what could happen is they could approve a budget in March and circumstances could change radically between March and June. Uh, or, and they might say, actually, we need to have more budget, less budget or whatever. If it's less, probably not because they can spend less. But if they need more budget, they might want to reconsider their budget, right? So that's why it's, I assume it's there. But after June 30th, you'd be reconsidering it during the operating year in which you have contracts. It just seems you'd be voting to take away money that you'd already obligated to employees. But it's only, it's only, um, so let's say that you have a budget for June 30 and you have a vote to reconsider on July, on, on um, August 1, okay? If you, that budget that was approved still is in place for all, all, all of July, right? It's not going away, but there's a vote to reconsider it and see whether it should be changed. Thank you. So you're basically, you're re-voting a prorated portion of the budget year. Basically, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sarita, Austin. So just a clarification, once uh, teachers have gotten a contract as opposed to a, a potential RIF notice in case the budget doesn't pass, once they have a contract, you can't take back that contract, right? Well, so, so no, I mean, there's a contractual obligation, but that contractual obligation is subject to the collective bargaining agreement. Right. Right, and, and therefore there might be, and there probably is, uh, a process for RIFs, for reductions in force. Right. right? Uh, that does allow that contract to be essentially breached. So. Right, but I would imagine school districts that haven't passed the budget yet gave everybody a rip. That's kind of the standard practice. So that, you know, in case they have to cut staff or cut uh, teachers, they have met the obligation of the contract. But if they've given a teacher a contract uh, for the next year, then I, my understanding is that they can't, that, that they can't change that. That's one question. But the other question I have is, can all these districts vote? Do all these districts have the capacity to hold a vote? Well, so in Act 92, you, you passed a law that creates flexibility in, in, how, in how to vote, right? So um, you, you allow Australian, Australian votes where it hadn't been authorized by the voters. You authorize drive-by, you authorize mail-in. So there are mechanisms in place now that could be used Okay. I think to more safely vote. Okay. I, I am curious about the, you know, the RIF and the contracts. I was, I wrote a note to, to find out what districts had already given staff a contract, you know, because that would make a difference in terms of what their options are if they can't get a budget passed. Okay. Thank you. Kathleen James. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Yeah. Get you next. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You want? I just realized Peter was a little bit before you. Peter, did you? 
Uh, I'll just clarify um, for Sarita. Uh, remember, we're talking about two different groups of, of budgets here. One group where the voters rejected it, in which case probably RIF notices were sent to teachers, and another group where a vote hasn't taken place yet. And so there's no necessarily expectation that you're going to need to RIF. Um, at the same time, almost no, very few districts have actually done contracts. There are letters of intent out, but because negotiations are ongoing, there actually aren't contracts in place yet. Um, and, I, and I am finding sort of the, the um, and this is for you, Jim, um, the whole revote or rescinding of a budget. There's no time limit on that. You know, usually yeah. you think of a budget is passed, uh, 30 days, the people have to petition for a revote. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, 30 days to petition, and then the revote has to happen uh, within 60 days after that 30 day period's up. Um, and then I think uh, there's, you have to have a supermajority basically to approve um, uh, a revote. Uh, and once you've done it once in a year, you can't do it again, I believe. So, you can't just keep doing it. And so if there never was a vote, a lot of that stuff doesn't apply. Is that correct? If there wasn't a vote, uh, that stuff doesn't apply. But to, to um, Rep Conlon's question earlier, here we're basically having the, um, uh, having, call it a budget again, okay? You have a budget for the next year done through this mechanism in your bill, right? So the question therefore is, should they be able to uh, we consider that that, and the, the intent of this bill is to say yes, you can. So, Kathleen, thanks. Um, one of the things, going back to some of our earlier um, conversation about trying to get this as close to the voters as possible. Um, and giving voters the maximum possible say at a time when, you know, that might be complicated um, and difficult. Um, would it be possible or practical um, to move forward with a bill as quickly as possible that includes both of these options? Thanks. Certainly something for discussion. I'm reminding people why um, I brought this forward as, as an option. Um, with 19 districts, we have 19 districts that don't have a budget yet for uh, no fault of their own. Um, with the, with the, the impact of a state of emergency, they are struggling to be able to get to a vote. So part of the reason we're having this conversation is one, maybe they're not gonna be able to get to a vote. If they can't get to a vote, what can we do? So that's number one. Uh, number two is um, the Ed Fund, as we know, whatever budget I passed or your district passed or everybody's district passed affects everybody else's district. So we have 19 districts that are starting behind um, in, in terms of moving forward. So there's the question of equity. So how can we provide some equity for these districts and going forward? Because we know when we get to FY22, there's gonna be some reconciliation going on and it's gonna be for everybody. And the point is to make sure that we don't have 19 districts that have already been hogtied by last year's budget and they have to make cuts and my district's making cuts and your district is making cuts, but they're starting from behind. So the question is, one, what if we're not able to vote? What if they can't get to a vote? Two, how can we provide some equity so that they're on equal footing going forward? And by, there's probably a third one there, Peter, but I'm forgetting what it is. Um, and, and districts need to get organized. They need to get organized. We have a tough year coming. So, so the question is, is there something the legislature can do if these districts can't get to a vote? And so it's one option is, okay, just keep borrowing, that's there. Everybody can continue to do that and, and keep trying to get to a vote and that's there. The other thing is to say, um, and, and keep trying to get to a vote. I mean, when these places contact me, I say, get to a vote, do your best to get your district to vote. That's, that's how you're gonna get to the voters and to figure out how to get to the voters as soon as possible. That's, that's what we want. 
um, if they can't get to a vote for the, we're already hearing, you know, town clerks that are all worried about this kind of a vote. And, and um, we also know that there's just the challenge of, of panicked taxpayers um, who are, are can, can, there's, there's a, is, is it fair to try to settle the challenges in the Ed Fund on 19 districts? Is that equitable is the question. Um, so that's why the reason I brought this this one forward, and this is I'm not attached to this. It's just an option that we've talked about, um, and it's certainly something we can put out. The Senate was not interested in our vote in our bill because they were concerned that districts would not have an opportunity to, to vote. This keeps in the opportunity to vote by June thirtieth, and if you don't get there, here are your defaults until you get to a vote. So you can still vote. You can still put it forward, but if you don't get there, your backstop is not a budget that's going to cripple you, is what we heard from the districts. All the, the districts we heard, when I asked them directly, I said, which would you rather do be tied to, to last year's budget when panicked voters are going to say, oh, good, now I know, you know, my taxes are going to be, be better. I can handle that. There's going to have to be something to do with property taxpayers, but I just am not sure that trying to do it on the backs of 19 school districts is the place to address that. It needs to be broader across all of us. So that's why I, I bring this forward as an option that might be more acceptable to the Senate because it allows the vote to continue to happen, but it doesn't hog tie them with last year's budget. So that's right, I bring it forward. I don't know what the response is gonna be, but I, I've been talking about it. So it just didn't seem fair for me to kind of keep it in my pocket without bringing the committee into that discussion. So so there, there's where it is. Dylan, Jean Batista. Yeah, I, I just, I appreciate where you're coming from because um, there's such a small D democratic piece of our uh, process in, in approving budgets. Um, and so I, I get where the Senate is on this, that that would be an important consideration. It's just how our system works. Local voters approve what they want um, and those decisions are funded. And so I, I actually, while I'm not, I'm not thrilled with any of our options because we're in a crisis, but I'm also aware that if it comes down to sorting this out by putting something together that um, deals with that need and then the competing need of providing certainty to those districts, mine is one, I know we have others in the committee. Um, I agree that the equity question going forward is problematic because setting the, the budget at a level going forward into a difficult year would be extremely challenging. And we don't know if anyone's gonna be able to vote this summer. Um, and so there's a lack of certainty that makes this very challenging. But I do appreciate that you, you are trying to balance that small d democratic need of voting um, and providing for it because I, I agree there, we get into some weird murky waters when we start um, creating the notion that we're imposing something and the education fund doesn't work that way. So somewhere between all these ideas, there is an answer. Um, and I'm glad at least that we have this in front of us. It's a good opportunity to think about that. Um, uh, uh, Peter, come. And Matt, Jim Matt, and, and Chris Meadows, you also have a district that's affected by this. so. So your input is is important. Um, uh, I just want to remind folks this this is a one year only. Uh, you know this is we're not setting policy for now going into forever. This is just to to get through this one budget cycle. Uh, and one thing I've sort of been thinking about as a school board member myself is um, how would I feel having this power to just essentially adopt a budget. Um, without having to go to the voters. And, you know, that might make me a little bit uncomfortable as well. And I think that um, a lot of districts will try to get to a vote if they can. Um, so one thing that I've thought about, I just throw this out there for folks to mull over, not discuss today, but uh, we, you know, because ours does allow a board to sort of authorize spending authority above they don't have authority for is maybe there should be an additional level of approval um, to do that. Maybe the State Board of Education, you'd have to go before them, go before some other type of committee, 
Secretary of Education, although that, that'd be a one person making a decision. I'm not so comfortable with that. Anyway, I throw that out there as just another wrinkle we could put in if people are uncomfortable with sort of um, the authority that this gives to school boards. School boards, I think themselves, aren't necessarily gonna be thoroughly comfortable making that move. Um, so I just, I throw that out there, thanks. And again, whatever's gonna happen is gonna start in the Senate. So that this is this is the conversation we're having. This is not necessarily a bill that we're talking about. Sarita Austin. Um, I like the proposal too, as well. You know, I think I like the equity issue and I like, um, you know, where, where school boards and school districts will be uh, going into um, 2022. The, the, again, I want to, my, my concern is do town clerks have the capacity, do towns have the capacity to hold a vote with a primary coming up? So that would be, I'm just curious about, I have no idea. I mean, maybe they can do both of these. I don't, I don't know what the workload is, but I think I, I would like to know if they, if they could, they have the capacity to do these two votes, um, you know, this summer. The, the, yeah, the bill, the bill is here in the event that there, there's a problem with that. That's what, what, what we're basically talking about. Um, let's see, Caleb Elder. Thanks. Um, so I, uh, I guess that I last week kind of heard somebody saying or 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 we heard that some advocates were saying that actually the senate's version with the 100 percent might be worse than the status quo the 87 percent in some ways um and i think that was characterized as maybe boards would be tempted to fall back on that amount or something um i started thinking along those lines and now i'm starting to wonder if maybe the existing law is the best option overall and the reason for that is i really want to see these local votes happen i want to see them happen safely and uh, I think the Secretary of State's guidance was helpful. I know it's a push. And the last thing I want to do is, is pin communities into a position where they need to have an unsafe vote. With that said, the authorization of local spending for schools is, uh, is, is a pretty sacred thing within, within, our, within our system. I'm, I'm really very leery to authorize any amount not approved by voters. And I'm afraid that either the Senate's version and even more, this version is a disincentive to ever have a vote. I, I, I can't see it as any other way. I think it disincentivizes the school board and the superintendent to warn a vote that um, is only going to be lower than what they've already got approved. It, that to me is, is a really hard policy for us to put in place. I would have a hard time supporting it, sadly. Kathleen, James. Yeah, um, I just wanted to underscore sort of a growing concern I'm having the more we talk about this with um, the Senate version, um, which is that, you know, in the wake of this crisis, I, I feel like we see time and time again, the, the problems that systems have when you underfund them, and then the years roll on. And if, if multiple districts around the state start this school year, um, with budgets that reflect FY21 realities, and then 19 districts get stuck with last year's budget, they're never gonna catch up. You know, then next year comes and they're working off of last year's budget and, you know, things are gonna get harder and harder. I, I just, I'm starting to really think about, you know, having, having 19 schools that are stuck within, um, you know, last year's funding forever without, without ever having the ability to get caught up. And that's starting to feel really, really unfair to me. Thanks. Thank you. I wanted to just make this an option. I'm happy to um, provide it to uh, our usual suspects. Um, Chris Meadows, you're an affected district. Yeah, I was just gonna, follow up on on Kath's statement there that they'll be behind if they still go to vote and they pass they're right where they would be anyway because that's what was warned and if they failed in the beginning and then rework the budget like Melton did 
they'd still be in the same spot. So I'm not sure if that totally would come true. Yeah, if I guess if they're unable to unable to vote or if it's too complicated to vote. So again, we're bringing this up in the event that districts are struggling with the ability to vote. Um, we have budgets, we have school districts that start July 1. Um, school districts typically borrow then anyway. Um, but again, this is, this is not in, in response to just the school districts that couldn't get a budget. This is in response to the fact that there are places that may never get to a budget. This is in response to the fact that the, the whole educational environment is going to be changed in the next school year. Um, Peter Conlon. Oh, let Casey too, but you haven't heard from you yet. I just have a question about, um, have we received a fiscal note, fiscal note any sooner than like two weeks ago? I haven't seen one since like the 28th or whatever. Have we seen one since? Do you mean on the, the current ed fund? Yeah. Um, and, and Chloe, I had actually, Chloe's, Chloe's with us and I had actually asked Chloe to say, what are, what are the, what's the fiscal impact of these three proposals? <laughs> One, well, not three. One is the, you know, if, if the default budgets are 2020, one if the default budgets are the current Warren budget, and one if they were uh, default budget plus 4%. Um, Chloe. Hi, yeah, I am available. I haven't had a chance yet um, to do the actual numbers, but I can talk about it in sort of in broad terms based on, um, you know, it, it just won't be, you know, down to the decimal. Um, but so essentially, the way that you know we are always we are always to some extent we're always sort of guessing what districts are going to spend until we actually receive their final budgets and they have been voted and you know we're able to. I mean, even usually when we set the yield in, in May, sometimes we'll even still have a couple of estimates in there um, just based on district responses. Um, but, and those, you, typically those all get finalized June 1st. So right now, so what I'm essentially coming to about to say is that right now, um, our education spending number that we have um, that we're carrying in the balance sheet right now and you know, working on our tax rate estimates are on is on about seventy seven percent of the districts, um, ninety two districts approximately. I've asked Brad James to see if he's had any more come in in the past couple of months, um, and he's working um, to try and update that information. But so for these districts that haven't voted, we currently have an estimate in there for them. Um, we might even have had, you know, some of those districts as part of those 77 that submitted, you know, um, a board approved budget essentially prior to town meeting. Um, but those budgets are included or estimates of those budgets are included in that current education spending number. So we're assuming that they are going to spend about the statewide average or we have their actual budget in there. Um, so now what we're talking about when we're looking at different proposals is if they don't go with their warned budget, which is essentially what we are estimating or have a proxy for, it would be a reduction to that education payment number. For example, if we held them level at FY20, um, based on the districts that we're looking at, and they make up approximately 22% of education spending on the whole. And if we look at those, and so those districts don't experience the same increase as everybody else, you're looking about a 13 or $14 million reduction to that education payment line. So essentially, um, you know, they will be, those that districts will be working with 14 million less dollars. Um, that we already are estimating that would in turn lower education spending and you know lower tax rates um, when we look at using a four percent inflator 
Um, that's just slightly less than the statewide average, which is about four, currently estimated at about 4.7%. Um, so that would just be, you know, a reduction of 0.7%. So approximately, you know, uh, a, a couple of million dollars, um, two or three max maximum, probably more like one or two actually. Um, so that's sort of what we're looking at. And I know it's sort of confusing. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you for that. Yeah. So just, just to clarify, if uh, they were held to the 2020 for those districts, that would be a, a reduction of about 13 million to the Ed Fund? Yes. <clears throat> okay, so, so we'd all benefit a little bit from that, huh? I feel like that's a trick question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by district, great. I would say that uh, Dylan's is perhaps not by that. <clears throat> um, and then if we went with the 4% inflator, that would look at a uh, about 2 to $3 million uh, reduction to spending. Is that right? I would say probably maybe even more in the one to two range. One to two range. And if yeah. we went with this, it would basically be pretty similar to what's already, what you're already planning because you're working off foreign budgets. Yes. So pretty much knowing. That. Exactly. That was a, a much more succinct summary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we need you to, to, to help us get to that. <laughs> sure. Um, Peter Coven. You know, we've talked a lot about the ability to get to a vote, and that's really a logistical matter with town clerks. But we also have to keep in mind the reality in which people are going to be voting. Um, you know, if you take a district that ha has a lot of tuition students and they have an increase in the number of students, yet their school district has 20% unemployment, they have no control over that increase but the people are not gonna pass a budget because of the economic impact. So if you think about the reality in which many of us had our school districts approved up here, and then we've got the rest of this 19 that may get theirs approved in a different economic environment, we have inequity there. I mean, eventually the deficit in the education fund is going to have to be addressed by everyone. And I think when we keep talking about the equity issue, what we're talking about is the economic realities in which budgets were approved. Um, and there are just some places they're gonna say, our voters, no matter what, we're not gonna get a budget approved, yet we still have 15% increase in uh, healthcare costs. Um, we still have to have the same staffing levels or in districts that have a lot of tuition students, they don't have any control over those costs. But I just wanted to bring that up as we talk about the importance of having a public vote. I think we also need to understand the reality in which that public vote takes place. Chris Meadows. No, I won't. I don't need to respond, I guess. Um, Dylan, Jim Batista. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is a really good discussion and I'm glad that we're having it at this length because there are a variety of opinions and I, I think they all um, are, are really valid, um, particularly because we have this hybrid local state decision-making process. You know, the piece of this that I'm trying to sort out is the equity question. And it is because the votes are taking place in essentially different worlds. And we need to acknowledge that and policy needs to acknowledge it. Um, and I don't have a great answer there because it's always sort of confounded me that some districts do vote later. When most go on town meeting day, there's a whole chunk of us who go later. It, it appears to be about you know 20% or so here. Um, of, of the money that we, is authorized. So I just, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, are we going to approach this decision with the facts before us, which are pretty clear, we're in a different world, um, or are we gonna go about business as usual and provide a process that checks all the boxes? And I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing anything other than acknowledging that we are in a different moment and that, we need to provide some flexibility for these districts. And it, it isn't me playing for the home team here. Um, certainly that's something I'm weighing, but it's also about the larger circumstance. We're talking about 22% of the funding in the Ed Fund. We're talking about a potential reduction of capacity of 13 to 14 million, uh, were we to assume that those budgets had proceeded. 
that to me is very problematic. And when we have a statewide funding formula in a crisis, I think we have an obligation to ensure that whatever decisions we make, um, don't put those districts on their heels because they're not gonna have much flexibility. The other piece is I have no certainty that votes are gonna be able to take place. I know it's aspirational that we do it. I know we have um, upcoming elections where town clerks are gonna have to adjust, but can we be sure when those spikes are going to occur and how it changes behavior? Um, do we have any certainty? So I just wanna continue to keep front and center. We're in an emergency and this is not business as usual. So thank you all for the feedback. I mean, it's really helpful. I appreciate where everyone's coming from. Um, Chris Meadows. Yeah, I'm just going to respond to the to the voting thing. I mean, we go to Hannaford and they allow 150 people into the store. And we, I feel like we have a means to be able to get a vote done, whether it's, you know, drive through voting where you do it outside under a tent or you can still do it in the town clerk's office um, and just limit the amount of people that, that come in. Um, I'm hopeful something can be done. I mean, it might be a question for Secretary of State or you know town clerks themselves, but it might be a good next step to figure out where we go for the voting. We could, we could hear from the town clerks or Secretary of State. Um, Jim, were you going to say something? Uh, no. No. Okay. Um, Peter Conlon. Sorry, I didn't lower my hand, but I will uh, uh, reiterate that this is a, a very good discussion. Kate, may I make just a final quick comment? Because sure. I heard a couple things from Dylan and Peter that I agree with, which is that we're in a totally different world. And I hear that a lot right now. Um, I just want people to keep in mind that the people who are voting now are voting in the same world we're living in. And the people who voted in March are the ones that voted in a different world. And we don't know when we're gonna get back. And um, there's nothing we can do to, to change that bifurcated reality, right? Like we can't, we can't take it back. But if what you're saying is, I don't wanna have a vote because I think I know what voters are gonna vote and it's gonna be no, that is not a legitimate reason to not have a vote. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, please, Larry. Um, you know, I'll go back again to what Peter was saying. Um, this is, these are very different times. And, you know, how did we ever get to a position where <clears throat> we have all of these different votes in all these different towns voting in different dates uh, I think you brought it up maybe a while back. Why can't all of these districts just vote on March 3rd or 4th or whenever we vote on that Tuesday? Um, it just appears that it would allow these districts that in SUs or whatever that have voted their budgets down would allow them more time to get their acts together, if that's what you want to call it. Um, so I'm not sure where that is in law or if that's something that happens in town charters or whatever, but it just doesn't seem, maybe it's time to really change. I mean, it's, something's gotta happen here. It's pre-act pre 60 is what it is. And we really haven't updated that when we move to it to the Ed Fund the way it is now. And I think that that's a good question. I would expect that we're gonna see uh, a bill um, next year in relation to that. I know that there are some districts that have not yet collected the last uh, payment for their 2020. Okay, this is May <laughs> and they haven't collected for 2020. Um, whereas other districts have collected that and given the money to the Ed Fund or, or paid their districts and uh, others have not. So there's, we are not equal in the way that we collect the money and we're not equal in the way that we vote. And there's the, the possibility that maybe that conversation needs to happen 
so there's some consistency since we're really talking about a statewide funding program, not not just a local local program. Well, I know I know there's great concern locally here um, in City Hall as to how many people are going to have their property tax money available on the 15th of May, right. as you just as you just mentioned. Um, that's the fourth you know the fourth payment. Yeah. Um, it's going to be pretty scary in the city of Rutland as to how much money they're going to collect in property taxes. And, and that's what I'm hearing from some of our local officials. And that's collecting May 15th for a school year that ends at the end of June. Seems late. <laughs> um, so that all that I would expect that that is definitely as we as we continually say that there's nothing like a crisis to point out the vulnerabilities in the system and that is definitely one. Um, so I'm certainly happy to bring in the town uh, clerks or the Secretary of State. The other thing is I'm happy to just leave this um, leave this on the wall, uh, so to speak. <laughs> um, uh, let others come forward and, and just indicate their interest in this or not. Um, it's just something that's been a conversation and it felt like the committee needed to have an opportunity to hear that thought. Just why I brought it forward. Um, Sarita Austin. I would find it really helpful to hear either from town clerks or the Secretary of State. We can do that. Avery, let's find uh, a time for to see if they can come in and just talk to us about, about that. Karen Horn from the um, town clerks and uh, Secretary of State, probably Will or one of them. Um, yes, Coop, Larry Coopley. Yeah, I'm, you know, the Senate bill, frankly, I think, I think we all realize, I hope that that's going to leave that's going to leave a lot of school districts, a lot of communities in, in a lot of strife um, using last year's budget. Um, I mean, just health, are you looking at health insurance premiums alone? I, I don't know how they'll do it. I just don't know how they'll, without having to lay teachers off, um, it, it, uh, taking programs away. Um, so I don't know. It's it doesn't seem that the Senate put a lot of thought into what they're doing here. Comments. <laughs> Kathleen James. Uh, well, related to what Coop just said, but sort of on the flip side, um, just about how much testimony we take in the timeline here, um, I feel a sense of urgency around this. Aren't these districts uh, feeling a huge sense of anxiety and waiting on us? What, what's our deadline? It is, we don't have to do anything. We can just leave current law. Current law, you know, would, would, they can borrow and then it actually sets a tax rate of $1. Then when they finally get a budget, um, that gets reconciled. So that can be a big surprise. One dollar is probably not where anybody's going to end up being. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, again, well, assuming that you know, assuming that current law is maybe not the best way to go. Um, I guess. Um, I. I guess I'm just wondering how quickly we're feeling like we want to or how much time we think we have uh, to maybe try to come to a good conclusion on this. So very good question. Dylan, Jean Batista. I mean, I was just gonna say, I also, I mean, obviously I share the urgency. I'm getting a lot of feedback here locally and elsewhere. And I do think the signals we send from the building are very important. Um, but I mean, I view today's proposal as, as trying to find a path, right? And so I'm willing to keep working at it if we can find a path, because it sounds like we reached a point where we might not be in agreement and something might not proceed at all. So I view this as our potential train to leave the station. Um, of course, we need to discuss what it looks like, but 
to me, sharing that urgency, I, I also want something that can pass or else nothing happens and it's 87%. Okay. And again, okay. just really trying to keep in mind that we've certainly heard from the folks in mental health that the start of the school year is gonna be seeing a, a really different world. We're gonna have teachers who are definitely, uh, really have gone through a pretty different semester and we have children that are returning that are gonna possibly look a little different from what they looked like when they left in March. So we're gonna be dealing with a system that's stressed. We have no idea school's going to be starting. We, you know, there, there's so many unanswered questions. There was also some hope to help these 19 districts to just be able to get a budget and start working on the 2022 budget for all of us, which is painful. Um, and again, I, to reiterate, at the moment, we're just waiting, uh, waiting for something from the Senate. And this is just an opportunity to start another conversation. Sarita Austin. Um, just this might be for Peter or Caleb. Is this health care increase uh, this year? Is that the, the result of the state negotiated contract that the teachers and school boards just went through, or is that implemented in a year or two? Uh, that no, it, it's a normal, you know, uh, actuarial increase in health care costs. Um, the added expense that you're referring to doesn't hit until uh, January, I think, for teachers. Um, but that, but the, but the statewide agreement is estimated to add another $25 million to the Ed Fund in costs, and that's largely due to um, healthcare being offered to a whole new um, group of employees, um, mainly support staff. And, and opening up the levels of healthcare to more people as well. <laughs> I, I'll add a note of optimism here to sort of bolster the argument for an alternative. Uh, we also have the potential that the federal government is going to say, you know, that $1.3 billion we sent you, you can use for revenue replacement. And therefore we might be entering an era where again, we have most districts just fine because they held a vote in the other reality and then a bunch of ones who held votes in the current reality who now can't really take advantage of the fact that our problem was solved. Unless they- know that's they, highly unlikely, but- They can still pass them. One issue. We, we, that's the thing, they could do the 87% borrowing, have that bailout, give them that money, then go pass their first budget for the full amount. Like if that yeah, happens, but, they could do that. It all depends on when they hold that vote. They could have a successful vote in September and we don't know that the, that the rules might be lifted in October. They, they can also hold the vote on June 15th and it passes and they're in the same boat as everybody else for March. We if don't know. We get that done. Yeah. That's great. That's yes. our preference. That all yep. along here is our preference. That they get to vote. I mean, what we heard from school boards on that Friday, we had so much testimony, is they want to have a vote. They want to have a successful vote. They don't want to go this route. Mm -hmm. um, and I know as a school board member, I would be uncomfortable moving ahead without something. But at a certain point, there's going to be, for some districts, probably. Uh, just a, 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 a point of, of, of where two forces come together and you can't find a solution. It's possible we'll do nothing. It's possible we'll leave it. We'll be back in August. I don't know what will happen. I, but I, I, do, I do feel for these districts, given the amount of stress. Chloe, what are you doing? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, that's that's fair. <laughs> I was I was like shuffling papers around on my desk, and I didn't realize I was unmuted. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Sorry. <laughs> um. So so that's just that's just we're just continuing the conversation. Do do some of these school boards do mailers to to their residents prior to a vote explaining they they all do it i know we get a thing in rutland city in every mailbox explaining the the budget and 
you know, for some reason, we don't seem to ever vote down a school budget, even though they increase by four or five million dollars a year. But um, I mean, there's a very, very good plan put together by our superintendent's office that explains what's going on, what, what we need, what our teachers need, and what our children need. Do all the school boards send that out to their constituency or I don't know. I would imagine. <laughs> Only I, we heard definitely heard down in, in um, the Wyndham, Wyndham areas that it's really about that meeting. It's yeah. really where they, they, they vote from the floor. Um, and that's when they hear about the budget and they get to ask questions and they get to vote for it on the floor. And I know that the town clerks down there are a little panicked about going to something else. At least that was the testimony we took from them when they. Yes. Went. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there we are. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this was really just to keep keep folks in the loop as to, to what's happening. Again, reiterating that uh, we're waiting for something from the Senate. Um, but to know that that. There, there are things happening out in the field.